It is my privilege to introduce our chapel speaker today, Dr. Jim Allman. Dr. Jim Allman earned his bachelor's from the University of Oklahoma, followed by his THM and THD from Dallas Theological Seminary. Dr. Allman was a professor at Crichton College for 18 years before joining the DTS faculty. And since 1987, he has also been a visiting lecturer in Australia, Ukraine, India, and Siberia. He served as a translator for many years uh, for many of the Psalms at the Holman Christian Standard Bible and currently serves at Dallas Theological Seminary as professor of Old Testament studies and Bible exposition. Now, I think that Dr. Allman's wife, Jan, is she here? Did she sneak in on us? She may be in transit. But I asked him specifically, how many grandchildren do you have? Eight. So if you want to really get to know the soft side of Dr. Allman, ask him about his grandkids. Would you please join me in welcoming our friend, Dr. Jim Allman, today. grandkids. I don't know where all that came from. Uh, it, it came up a whole lot quicker than I thought it was going to. Uh, but uh, I'd like to turn to Romans chapter 12 this morning. Famous passage, well-known passage, um, one that all of us have memorized at one time or another. Uh, in my early Christian life, it was used to develop the notion that every Christian needs to come to a specific point in his life where uh, you make a specific commitment to Jesus in such a way that it never come, uh, is taken back. Uh, you are from that point on his and um, uh, you are a complete servant to him. And that was derived from the clear and obvious interpretation of the aorist tense of the, the word present, because aorist means once for all, and so I hope to, to hear maybe a little more twittering than that, but uh, twittering now is a different word, uh, but I was hoping for a little bit more. Uh, all of that started being undone when I came here and started taking Greek here. Um, the aorist tense is the tense you use, especially in the indicative, outside the indicative, when you want to say as little about the, the, the event as possible, you just want to state that the event should occur. Does that make sense to you? It's, it's a orizo. It is without horizon. It's without demarcation. So you just simply state, I want you to make your body do something with your body. I want you to, to present it. Um, so here we are. What are we to do with this? How are we to understand it? Another aspect of my background that bears on what I want to say to us this morning is that I was raised in a pietistic church, good Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. It was quite pietistic, and so you memorized verses. Um, uh, and as you memorized verses, the more, more verses you had in memory, the better you were spiritually, obviously, because either the word of God will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the word of God. And so I used that idea for a long time till a friend of mine who uh, said to me one day, Jim, that doesn't make any sense. Haven't you ever gone down in temptation quoting scripture? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so what? What's going on here? What, what, we, what we have to do is think, oh, here she is, my brothers and sisters. My wife has come in. Uh, Jan, stand. Stand, sweetie. Stand. Stand. Thank you. There she is. Her, her reward in heaven is great. She has had a 49-year tribulation. For, for her, the coming of the Lord is post-tribulation. So, uh, the, also for Dallas Seminary students, uh, after you graduate, the coming of the Lord, that's post-tribulational too. But the, uh, um, so, so what's the point? Why bring up this thing about memorizing scripture? 
Because we tend to treat, because of the way we memorize scripture, we tend to treat verses as unrelated to their context. We know, yeah, there's a context, but, but I don't know what it is. I know the verse. That's what I need. A um, lady told me one time, I don't know about all this evidence you give, but I know what that verse means, and it doesn't mean what you say. Uh, and she was being trained to be a Bible translator. Scared me to death. Um, Romans 12, 1 and 2. See, I have a doctorate from Dallas Seminary, and I know great and wise things most people don't know. <sighs> he didn't do justice to me when he introduced me. <laughs> My proper title, brothers and sisters, is Reverend Doctor Professor Professor. And he just professor of Old Testament and Bible exposition. No, if I was in India, they would give it to me. Now, that's pretty wordy, and it gets awfully tiresome, tedious, even for me. So if you want to address me, just call me Your Grace, and I will answer. Uh, <laughs> back to the point. <laughs> what? <laughs> Since I have this training at Dallas Seminary, I know that Romans 12 comes after Romans 1 to 11. <laughs> and before 13 to 15. And it turns out that Romans 12, 1 and 2 is kind of an introduction to a whole section of Romans. Up to this point, Paul has been arguing a case. He started in chapter 1. The case is that, that we have right relationship to God through faith in our Lord Jesus, and that is the established fact. But he's addressing a problem in the church at Rome, a problem of disunity. And in chapter 12, 1 and 2, he introduces the section that's going to address specifics about disunity in the church at Rome. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, and I please forgive me, I learned this verse in King James. It's going to come out in King James even if I look at my Bible. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove that the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. And here it is, introduction to chapters 12 to 15. What's he talking about? Well, the core of what, he, what I want to say this morning is in verse 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. On the strength of all that we've said in chapters 1 to 11, therefore, present your bodies. And he not only says, therefore, but by the mercies of God. Yes? Mercy. It, it, there's, difference, there's difference of opinion whether we should translate this mercy or mercies. It's plural in Greek, but there might be reasons for that beyond making the term plural. If it's plural, then I should read it as all the merciful acts of God that are recounted in chapters 1 to 11. All that God has done for us chapters 1 to 11. Does that make sense to you? So therefore takes in chapters 1 to 11. By the mercies of God takes in chapters 1 to 11. I've, I've got to be like a friend of mine said, I've got to be like a traveler who at each stopping point, I'm picking up a piece of luggage and I'm adding it to my, my, uh, my equipment. So in chapter 1, I'm picking up information in chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So I'm bringing all that information from chapters 1 to 11 to chapter 12. And I hear Paul say, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In light of all the mercy of God in chapters 1 to 11, there is a reasonable response and the reasonable response is to make your body a living sacrifice. I can't do it, verse 2, verse two I can't do it unless I have a renewed mind. You see, because in Romans, turn to Romans 14 just a moment. In Romans, there are two groups 
he will name one of the groups in, verse, in chapter 14. The other group he names in chapter 15. Um, uh, him who is weak in the faith, receive, but not to discussions about doubtful things. Weak? Uh, one believes he can eat all things. Uh, the weak eat vegetables. <sighs> I am not weak. <laughs> Uh, but if there are weak, what else are there? Strong. So in chapter 15, 1, Paul identifies himself as a member of the group called strong. If you look there further in chapter 14, though, verse 3 gives us the specific problem, I think, that has motivated the book of Romans. And that is that the weak look at the strong and, and, and condemn them. How how, how can you eat meat and call yourself a Christian? The strong look at the weak. Uh, don't bother with them. They don't understand grace. <laughs> Which one's right? So verse 3, the one who eats, let him not despise the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat, let him not despise the one who does, for God has accepted him. You, who are you to judge another man's servant? Who do you, who do you think you are? Well, you're to be a living sacrifice. This whole section is introduced by being a living sacrifice. I had not done this before. I have studied Romans off and on since 1973 and taught it, I've lost track, maybe 30 or 40 times in courses. Um, but I never asked this question. What does this word present mean? How is it used in the Old Testament? It's not in the, in the sacrificial context. But a related word is, I want you to see something really interesting here. Uh, present your bodies alive. Yes? Yes? Right. There's only one other place I know of in the Bible that has those two words together. <laughs> it's in Leviticus 16.10 where you're talking about the animal, the, the goat that's going to be sent out into the wilderness to, to whatever that is, Azazel. Are you with me here? It's in, in the Septuagint, it's translated, the goat for sending away. I pondered that this morning. I thought, what does that signify? And since it's a new idea, it's probably wrong. All right. But it just occurs to me, maybe God in Romans 12 is, is wanting us to think of ourselves as a goat being led out to serve the community by going away, in effect, in, in Leviticus 16.10, are you with me here? To bear the weaknesses of the community, in effect. Present your body a living sacrifice. It's going to be holy. It's going to be well-pleasing to God. And that's your reasonable service. But I can't do that unless I have my not mind renewed, how can I serve you? How can I avoid despising you if I'm strong? How can I avoid judging you if I'm weak? If I don't have my not mind renewed, well, where am I going to get my mind renewed? Chapters 1 to 11. Okay. So you see, I have a doctorate from Dallas Seminary, and I know great and wise things most people don't know. And chapters 1 to 11 come before chapter 12, 1 and 2. And it's followed by 12, 3 to 15, 13. So what does it look like? How do I make my body a living sacrifice? There were spiritual life teachers when I was growing up who said you needed to crucify yourself. And then there was a great, well-known uh, preacher at, in Philadelphia Donald Gray Barnhouse, who said, I can't, I can't understand, in a sense, what sacrificing your crucifying yourself is, but he said, how do you do it? I can understand nailing your feet to the cross. I can understand nailing one hand to the cross. 
Now well, you got the other one nailed up. <laughs> now this isn't a dead sacrifice. This is a living sacrifice. It cannot be offered once. It is a lifetime sacrifice. So what does it look like? How does it function? Well, I have a doctorate from Dallas Seminary, and I know great and wise things most people don't know. And so if I've got Romans 12, 1 and 2, then I have a Romans 12, 3, probably. Yes? So as I look at the text, sure enough, there's a verse 3. And what follows is three major sections from this point until chapter 15, 13. After 15, 13, Paul turns to what he normally does at the end of a letter, namely general exhortations and talk about his plans and his, his, uh, his relationships with people at the church and so on. But, but from, 50, uh, from 12, 3 to 15, 13, he has three major sections. The first one is in verses 3 to 8. And I ask people, well, what does a living sacrifice look like in verses 3 to 8? And they say, well, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Uh, yes, <laughs> but, but how do you do that? Notice verse 3 follows verse 2. <laughs> yes. And in verse 2, we're to have our minds renewed. And verse 3 talks about not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to. Well, what does it look like to think more highly of yourself than you ought to? What if thinking of, of yourself more highly than you ought to is related to spiritual gifts, look at verse 8. <laughs> it's a basic linguistic principle. When you put two things together, they are intended to be related in some way. And so when I have verse 8 so closely related and in the same paragraph as verse 3, then I probably have to start thinking about, well, what do spiritual gifts have to do with not thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think? If I'm involved in a community of believers, but my involvement is to, to find a church where I'm being fed, for example, which is a common way that people think about choosing a church today, it's all wrong, folks. We're not in the body to be fed. We're in the body to make our bodies living sacrifices. And I want you to note only one of the spiritual gifts there in verse 8. It's the gift of showing mercy. Two things about that. It's very difficult to do in the Sunday morning gathering. Yes? I... I never, never had a church say, now we're going to give the opportunity for people to show mercy. <laughs> so so what, is, what are we talking about? Second thing I want you to notice is that people who have the gift of mercy are probably people who are surrounded by folks who are hurting badly in all kinds of different ways. And if you have the gift of mercy, it's probably going to be costly to you to exercise it. But what if that's true of all of the spiritual gifts? What if all the spiritual gifts are not given to us to make me fulfilled, make me satisfied, but it's to satisfy the needs of others? Does this make sense to you? What if I'm in the body not to be served, but to serve? Does that call any verse to mind? Like Mark 10, 45? What if I'm to be like the Savior who came not to be served, but to serve? He gives his life a ransom for many. We are in the body to serve. The average ox being sacrificed probably didn't enjoy it. <laughs> then let me propose that at least initially, the way God intends to use you in the body of Christ may not be something you enjoy. That as you grow and mature in the spiritual life, you will come to enjoy the reality that God is at work in you and he is meeting the needs of other people. But that's not what a spiritual gift is. A gift is sacrifice. So the first way Paul illustrates what it means to make a living sacrifice is through spiritual gifts. And when you don't practice your spiritual gifting... You're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. 
You're very self-centered. You haven't grown up at all. You need to grow up. If you choose a church because I enjoy the music, I enjoy the preaching. You choose a church, you choose a fellowship of believers based on where you can serve. Second, verse 9 through 13, 10. Let love be without play acting. Um, there's an interesting digression in verse 18 through 13, 7 about vengeance. <clears throat> but the whole passage is about love. Do you notice there in verse 9, the, f- the very first words of, in, in my text are love. Must be, must be genuine. And then go to chapter 10, I'm sorry, 13, verse 8. And notice what verses 8, 9, and 10 are about. What's it about? Is it not about love? Yeah. So I have a bookend here between chapter uh, 13, I'm sorry, verse uh, chapter 12, verse 9, and 13, 10. So even that passage on submission to the government and vengeance is about love. Here, Paul says, you got a lot to do if you're making your body a living sacrifice, one of the ways to do it is by love that's not dissembled, it's genuine, it's the authentic article. And when you do that, that's going to mean a lot of late nights, a lot of weariness, a lot of problems, a lot of struggle. If you've raised children, is that true? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Got some unusual responses over here on the left. <laughs> uh, um, but you wouldn't trade it. My son got lost one day. We didn't know where he was. <laughs> he was lost for about five hours. He walked 11 and a half miles home from school because he didn't want to borrow any money from anybody to call for, for us to come pick him up. He was at a track meet. When I found out he was home and safe, I called home. Jan said, he's home and he's safe. And I thought, thank you, Lord. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> but that's what love does, isn't it? So one thing that's off the plate, one thing you don't have to bother with, 12, 8 through 13, I'm sorry, 12, 18 through 13, 7, is vengeance. That's, that's in God's hands. He's delegated to the government. You, we, we pay taxes to the government because they do, they are ministers of, of God for justice. That's the language that's used in the text here. So I don't have to bother with that. Let's just get about the business of loving without dissembling. What does it look like to make a living sacrifice? It means to minister in spiritual gifting. It means to love without play acting. And chapter 14, 1 to 15, 13, it means to accept people who live the Christian life differently than you do. Is, I'm so thankful the issue here in chapter 14 was meat. Because it could have been on some other things that are more controversial, but here it's meat. Is there anything in scripture that says you can't eat meat? What do you think? What do you think? I'm getting no response. Are you there? You're out there. I see your faces. I just. <laughs> Is there anything in scripture mandating that we eat no meat? No. Is there anything in scripture that mandates that we must eat meat? No. I'm so thankful that it's this. Um, Could have been any number of other things, but it's this. So what is the right approach? Well, looking a little further into chapter 14, verse 5. For a one man honors one day above another, and another honors every day. Which one's right? Uh, 
you're not looking at the text. See, I don't have it projected on the screen, so you don't know what to, you, you know this, you know what this is? This is a book, amen, it has pages in it, and you, and, and you have random access, amen? Right, so I have memory that allows me to access this. So the rest of the verse says, let each one be convinced in his own mind. For, he says, um, none of you lives for himself and none of you dies for himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So if we live or if we die, we're the Lord's. I am not your servant. You are not mine. We are all servants of Christ. And those who eat meat are approved by God. Those who do not eat meat are approved by God. So how am I to treat you? Well, what did chapters 1 to 11 teach? Are we accepted because of what we do? Or are we accepted because of the work of Christ? So I take Romans 15, 7 as the summation of the entire book of Romans. Wherefore, accept one another. That's summarizing chapters 12 to 15. As Christ received you, that's summarizing chapters 1 to 11, for the glory of God. In Psalm 19, we read that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalm 29, the storm coming off the sea onto the mountains of Lebanon shows the glory of God. In Genesis 1, his mighty word spoken brings everything into existence. Well, what do you think is more glorifying to God? A thunderstorm or a community of people who live their lives making their bodies living sacrifices who minister to one another in their spiritual gifting, who love without play acting, and who accept one another even when we differ about the specifics of the way the Christian life ought to be lived. Um, the church is not about organizations. It's not about structures. It's about people and relationships. Make your life a living sacrifice. And with that, God is well pleased. Let's close with prayer. Father, you've saved us by grace. And by grace, you have enabled us for the service that you intended to, to do through us. So much we need to learn, but so much we've already learned Teach us to live by grace, to, to, to serve by grace, and understand ourselves as your servants to be offered as, as a living goat <laughs> before you to do whatever your will is. We are, we are yours. You are our master. You are our brother. You are our husband. You, O oh Jesus, are our savior. And teach us to live in light of that, to value each other the way you value us. Teach us to receive one another as Jesus has received us for your great glory. Oh, Father, we pray in his name. Amen.